lost Now it knows what we've lost In this company town It's what we know Change comes hard Change comes slow Until the bottom falls out That's how it goes down Until the money's all drained From a company town Till the life's all drained out Of a company town Please call the roll. Mayor Williams. I'm here. Councilmember Grimes. Here. Councilmember Mail. Here. Councilmember Stewart. Here. Councilmember Stewart. Present. Councilmember Smith. Here. Councilmember Fultz. Here. Okay. Uh, I have some updates on the agenda, and there are some things that are relatively new as of today. So what's on the printed rolling agenda uh, will be updated. But I want to call everybody's attention to the fact that we will be back here tomorrow night, Tuesday, February 3rd, for the second and, I hope, final listening session on the Tacoma Junction redevelopment at 7 o'clock in this room. Uh, then next Monday, we have a uh, presentation starting at 7 o'clock, which is from the Luke Meyer Partnership on Options for Library Redesign. And an added item on next Monday's agenda is a work session discussion of uh, criteria that the council might be interested in using in evaluating Tacoma Junction redevelopment and uh, how we might use that going forward. Then the next day, Tuesday, February 10th, has been uh, listed as a tentative listening session number three. Uh, I think we will find that we have uh, heard what we need to hear tomorrow night. That was always a uh, tentative one. And I'd really only like to do that if absolutely necessary. I'm hoping that uh, people who come tomorrow night, that we hear from different people, people we have not heard from before. I don't think we need to hear from the same people again. Um, so hopefully that will take care of things. Then the following day, Wednesday that week, uh, for the third night in a row, we will be here. And that will be the uh, department roundtables. And that's at 730. And that's the first of two department roundtables as we get ready for the budget. Uh, Monday, February 16th is President's Day. The city offices will be closed both Sunday the 15th and Monday the 16th. Then on Tuesday, February 17th, uh, what I'd like to do is schedule in place of a city council work session, uh, I'd like to schedule a closed session where the council would meet with the uh, potential developers one at a time. And uh, we have a closed session that evening. And then when we come back uh, on, the, on the following Monday, February 23rd, we would have a discussion of next steps on the Tacoma Junction redevelopment. So that's some changes from what's printed, but uh, we'll go forward with that schedule. Uh, next. We will go to uh, public comments, and that would be on anything uh, anybody wants to talk about. Um, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to uh, Pastor Wright first. Just for the uh, public record, I wanted to express my appreciation uh, to the city of Tacoma Park um, Chief Goldberg, uh, the mayor, our councilman Seth Grimes, for your support when we hosted the recent funeral for the uh, demised officer 
uh, Craig Chandler. We couldn't have done it without you. The congregation appreciates it, and I'm just proud to be a citizen of Tacoma Park. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pastor Wright. Right. Mr. Loveless. Hello, my name is Pat Loveless. I'm your official beach delegate, 7620 Maple Avenue, Tacoma Park. I'd like to uh, ask you people up there if we could uh, look into uh, putting on the agenda a proposition to make Tacoma Park a drone-free city because we saw what the drones can do already. You know, home, you know, home-bought drones, homemade drones, and so forth <clears throat> within, within our own area. They crashed one on the White House lawn, near the White House lawn, they crashed a drone. And they said it's a huge breach in security. Well, maybe they'll wake up and realize it's a huge breach in privacy and security for all of us. I think Tacoma Park should uh, lead the way, again, in this area, lead the way to become a drone-free city, not allowing any drones within our city boundaries or to be built within our city boundaries, flown or assembled or any other parts going throughout our city, like we do with the nuclear weapons, because drones are to our privacy with nuclear weapons are to our cities. They're just destroying us. They make us live in fear. And again, you don't know what, what those little drones can bring. <clears throat> they can carry a disease. They can carry a, a bomb. They can carry a, you know, a flammable liquid. They can do anything. We can do in everything we can to prevent that from happening, not allowing it to happen. What do you call security when they say we're going to stop this from happening? Yeah, we allow this to happen. That's getting that kind of talking back ass, which I think so. I think we've got to stop that and start getting on, on what really the problem is. And I'd like to see them do that. We've got to stop the drones from going in our city. This is supposed to be a peaceful city. And I'd like to see it stay that way. And I'd like to also, uh, I'd like to also ask the arborist if he's up there. I've meant to ask this for many, many months. What is the <laughs> oldest and largest trees in Tacoma Park? Do they know <laughs> what the oldest tree is and what the largest tree is? I'd like to know that. And also, uh, also, I'd like to uh, ask if uh, that sign has been removed from uh, our area yet. You know, the uh, Frank Joe sign. I'd like to know if that's been removed yet. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. We finally did it. <laughs> See, one person can make a difference, and this is a classic example of it. So let, let every other person out there who says one person can't make a difference or one vote don't matter, let them get up there and and tell me that, because I proved one person makes a difference. And thank you very much, everybody, for uh, listening. Thank you. And I'd like to, again, stress that we got to do everything we can to protect our right to privacy, protect our, uh, our right to uh, safety, and our right to our, uh, our city by stopping the drones from flying and, and being manufactured anywhere around Tacoma Park. Please, this is Tacoma Park. Let's Thank remember you, that. Lovers. Thank you. Anybody else? Good evening, Mayor Council. Burn Kelly, 307 Circle Avenue, Tacoma Park. I'm here tonight because I'm very glad to uh, the fact that we have an arborist in the town and a tree ordinance, and I seek to make improvements to that. And I uh, was recently referred to by the city attorney. Uh, thanks to you, Bruce, for uh, putting me in touch on of an issue I had. Um, I just wanted to point out that, the, that the, I had not heard back from the city attorney um, and as a result of the request made, but I did bring the uh, COMAR, the Code of Maryland Regulations, with me, and I can give you the number of the uh, chapter verse. It's a 08.19.2. 06.01, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Anybody else? Hi, Thea Scarato. I'm here to just share some information from France and Canada. Last week, the French Parliament passed a law addressing Wi-Fi radiation. It's the first of its kind in the world. It passed, because I'm going to talk about one that didn't pass right after. 
Um, any advertisement for cell phones must clearly and legibly mention the recommended use of a hands-free accessory to decrease the radiation to the brain. Violators will be subject to a fine of 75,000 euros. That's a lot of money. Anyone selling a cell phone must provide, upon request, an accessory designed for children under 14 years of age that reduces their exposure to radio frequency radiation. And I'm only reading a few points from this, this piece, this law. Wi-Fi access um, in elementary schools must be disabled when not in use for teaching. This is very important. Now, it is not... This should, it could be much stronger if they, if they need to turn it off all the time. But for now, it's turn it off when not in use, which means that the industrial routers, which are in classrooms, are not on all the time, giving the kids what is full body exposure. Um, uh, six hours a day of it. And there's a lot of classes in Montgomery County now where kids aren't even using the internet, but the routers are still on. They are far more powerful than the routers that we have in our homes. Wireless internet is banned, prohibited, in any place dedicated to the welcome rest and activities of children under three years of age. It's banned in nursery schools. Um, and one year from today, the government shall submit to the parliament a report on electromagnetic hypersensitivity. There's a growing number of people who are becoming sick from this radiation. I don't know if you saw the Washingtonian article last month about Green Bank. Uh, there was an article about people who are moving to a town without Wi-Fi um, in an effort to get away from the radiation because then they don't, don't have the symptoms that they usually have. So you can go online and read all about the other points. There's actually far more to that bill. In Canada last month, the MP Terrence Young introduced the first ever national bill that would require labels on all wireless devices that address the public health risks. And he's got four party support for that bill. And I'd like to read you what he said. This did not pass yet. This has just been introduced. La the purpose of C648 is to protect Canadians by changing the way we think about cellular devices, Wi-Fi, portable devices, baby monitors, and other Wi-Fi devices by empowering them with the information they need to understand potential serious risk to their health from long-term and continuous use of these devices and the greater risk to children. Frank Clegg, president of Microsoft Canada from 1990 to 2004, that's 14 years, um, who supported that bill, it was at the press conference, um, and he talks, about, he talks about a lot of things. You can go online and read that, and I sincerely hope, and I have hope, that Tacoma Park will take action and inform the community about this issue. So people need to know how to use devices more safely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love it. Love it. Love it. Anybody else? Okay, thank you all. We'll move now to council comments. <clears throat> Seeing no lights, I'll do a couple. Um, <clears throat> just want to let people know that uh, I'm serving on a uh, COG advisory work group that's uh, coordinating on uh, advocacy for various uh, regional issues in both Annapolis and Richmond. And so if anybody has any issues that you think might be uh, helpful to have COG consider uh, as the uh, legislatures are in session, uh, let me know. Um, I wanted to let people know that I did meet with the co-op today and had a good meeting. Um, I will be in Annapolis most of the rest of the week. I'll be testifying tomorrow. I'll be at the Legislative Committee on Wednesday, and I have the annual Mayor's Association Conference Thursday and Friday. Uh, and then just one thing I want to check with the city clerk. Uh, do we know if we got the uh, clean copy of the resolution on the hospital on the city's website yet? I looked and didn't see it. Uh, it should be. Um, I'll make sure it's up there. Okay. Just to tonight, just to, thank sure you. Just to let people know that uh, since we made some uh, major revisions to it last week when we passed it, we wanted to make sure that people could see the uh, copy as passed. Any other comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Schultz. Uh, just quickly to mention, to probably a lot of people, if not everybody knows it by this time, that Sligo Creek Parkway is now, actually as of uh, last Friday, open to uh, all, tr all traffic in all directions. The uh, intersection and all the barriers and rubber 
barrels and all that <coughs> paraphernalia is gone and it's now functioning as a regular intersection like we had all prayed for for such a long time. So just welcome to use it. Anybody else? All right, uh, we'll move along to the city manager's comments. Good evening, I've got a, a couple items. Um, I wanted to give an update on the status of the dog park. Um, we talked a little bit about this offline, but I wanted to make sure that um, this was public information. Uh, I think originally we were gonna have a discussion of the dog park on today, so uh, people may be paying attention. The concept plan that had been prepared for the dog park um, was determined to require a lot of engineering design work, uh, which would be costly, um, and also would have actual construction costs that would be costly. Um, for that reason, city staff met with representatives of Tacoma Dogs to go over those plans to find, uh, uh, to look and see if there was a way to come up with at least a phase one plan that was easier to advance and less expensive. We had had a lot of uh, good suggestions from engineers that we consulted with, as well as staff from Park and Planning, <clears throat> to help make the design um, less difficult to design and also less costly to build. The Eric Saul, who's been work volunteering as an architect for Tacoma Dogs, will be working on this new design based on those recommendations. We anticipate getting that new design within about a week. It'll then go um, to check to see if we do need any additional engineering work. We anticipate um, bringing back plans and recommended um, some cost options for the council to consider at perhaps the March 2nd council meeting. So I wanted to let people know about that. I also wanted to uh, indicate that um, over the weekend, the Tacoma Metro uh, public hearing staff comments were released by WMATA. Any comments on those staff recommendations? St I'm sorry? Staff, staff report. Staff report. Public hearing. Yes, and it had staff recommendations based on the public hearing comments from last June. Any comments on the WMATA staff recommendations are due by March 2nd. The report that is online on the WMATA <coughs> website includes a new site design, and it also includes an updated environmental report, uh, both of which we're reviewing. It's likely to go to WMATA's Planning, Development, and Real Estate Committee on March 12th for approval and to the full board for approval as a report on March 26th. If those things happen, um, about a month or so after that, the DC zoning's um, planned unit development process would begin. Then we go through a whole public process related to that, and we'll see what the role is that we uh, play, but it does take a long time once it gets into zoning, so there's that. I'd also like to um, make a couple comments about the snow regulations and snow shoveling. Um, first of all, we had um, talked about some, kind of looked at the snow regulations that are in the city's code. We're not likely to work more on the code changes this winter simply because of staff time. Um, I do want to let you know that I'm, uh, I've given some direction for us to be a little more balanced about when we get notices out for lack of snow shoveling. Uh, we don't want to give them out too fast. We certainly want to encourage people to shovel. And so trying to do that in a, in a fair way is something that um, is a priority of mine. And I mentioned, wanted to mention that the Lifelong Tacoma Snow Angel program did go into force one day. Uh, they partner with the Tacoma Park Middle Schools Difference Makers Club, and it was had rave reviews from all I have heard. Um, we now have about 27 households signed up for that assistance for people who are not able to shovel uh, and need some help for shoveling. Um, if anyone has um, interest in that program, they can go on the Lifelong Tacoma um, page of the city's website. And um, the final thing I just wanted to mention um, is that I didn't have the opportunity to say anything um, when Brian Kenner's uh, resolution thanking him for his service uh, occurred last week. And I just wanted to note that I personally really appreciated the opportunity to work with him. Um, I enjoyed hearing his insights uh, on city um, processes, staff, and issues. I appreciated that we saw eye to eye on how to manage, and that was a, a pleasant um, part of working with him. And 
you know, in some, he's a value, valued colleague and a good friend. And I appreciate the opportunity. I wanted to let him know that I wish him the best as well on his new position. Open for any questions from here? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up is the legislative update. I can throw it over to Jesse's hands. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go into uh, one of the things is, is we're trying to into it. share up, share our work. And Jesse will kind of be taking the staff lead on working with legislative items. Um, I do want to note that I did get a, a call from Michelle Douglas about the um, one of our main alcoholic beverage license bill that it's not showing up on the um, schedule because of a. Sounds like a problem um, that happened in uh, Jamie Raskin's office for which they have corrected it, but it, so it will show up soon. Should not cause a problem with getting the um, bill through, but it's why there is a delay. So it was nice to get a heads up about why it didn't show up yet on the uh, agenda for the various bills. And do you want to say anything, Jesse? About No? Okay. Um, I think maybe... Bruce, you'll have some more information, and I know certainly after Wednesday's legislative committee, right. um, but we will have a full list next week for status of various legislative items. And I, I can just uh, mention quickly three items that uh, are among the bills that we're going to be discussing tomorrow or Wednesday uh, at the legislative committee. Uh, one of them that I'm assuming that we don't have a problem with is Senate Bill 132. Uh, which is looking to change it so that uh, the so that we the council would have to approve whoever is going to be the uh, employee who uh, is designated to uh, kind of approve and pass on for, uh, speed camera tickets, and I'm assuming that us having to uh, approve that person formally shouldn't be an issue. And if, and if it is an issue, I need to know before Wednesday. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's contrary to our charter that the council directs staff, and so naming a particular individual could be seen as directing staff and therefore contrary to our charter. Yes, I just, I just really learned about this today, so I don't have a, a, a statement back on that. I mean, I would think certainly that the council could direct the city manager you know, or yes. his or her designee. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, one that uh, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, MML is going to oppose uh, is uh, raising the uh, local government tort claims limit on liability from, uh, I think it's from 500000 to a million per incident. It's like, no, we don't need to do that. Um, and another one which uh, I was surprised to see was uh, House Bill 161, which is uh, changing what businesses, local governments can collect property tax, personal property tax from, business personal property tax, uh, and it would limit it to uh, to almost none of the businesses that we have. So uh, I'm assuming that there will be some fairly robust discussion about that bill and uh, that MML will oppose it. But would that apply to counties as well? I don't remember. I tend to think not, but I'm not sure. But it would just uh, take one of the few ways that municipal governments have of uh, raising money to pay expenses and take it off the plate. When, and we're very limited now in what we can do. So I'll have a longer report next week. All right, uh, we don't have any minutes to adopt this evening, so we'll move to the presentation, and we're going to have a uh, report from the city Ar arborist, his annual report. Is that something that the clerk could share electronically since I don't, unless it's been put in my mailbox? It should be online, but 
Okay. Oh, it's online. Great. Okay. That. Thank you. Good evening, all. Uh, I'm afraid I don't know what the largest and oldest tree in town is. <laughs> there are a couple of big old white oaks that I would guess are in the 200-year range and 40 to 50-inch diameter. We do have a couple of champion trees in town, but not, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the oldest or largest of any variety. Um, and, and I'll claim one of the large white oaks. You can claim one of that, yes. Um, I've, you all have received and I hope had a chance to read my two-page report, which contains data from the last year along with uh, some information. Um, there's not anything of great import. Um, I, I think it was interesting, the uh, change in number of applications received and issued over the last four years has been reduced significantly uh, from a, let's see, in 2011 there were 261 trees removed privately and last year there was only 180, 222 the year before, so we've got a bit of a slide and I looked back to I think it was 2005, and it had been running at the mid 260s since then. And so I'm, I was trying to find weather data to determine how long ago the last years of drought were. And I think it was 2011, maybe early 2012, and so just trying to figure out why we're losing less trees than we were. And, if I find out anything, I'll let you all know on that. Um, let's see. And what is up on your websites now is, uh, remember the canopy density report that we got 2013, no, 2011, where, let's see, okay. This, this is different from doing it on my screen at home. But when we had LIDAR and, um, come on. I think you're on Gaithersburg. Yeah. yeah. I can move the data, but I can't move the controls out. Um, but it said that the city was 49% canopy, or 61, whatever it was that I reported. This is the same comparable data four years later, so that when I get our city cut out from this data, we'll be able to do an absolute comparison of changing canopy from the earlier one to this one. See looking at the numbers of removals we've got, whether we are losing or gaining canopy, um, and see what has changed. Now, this is on a one-foot pixel, so it picks up newly planted trees as well as big ones, tells us what is open space, tells us what can be planted or can be planted but is unlikely to be, i.e. a parking lot, could be dug up and you could plant. A yard can be planted. Um, I'll, the old report is up on the website. Um, Todd, this just came out, is that correct? This, you know, I don't know. I talked with one of my colleagues about it maybe eight or nine months ago, and I hadn't heard any more, so I just, I just found it. It's on 214 data, I believe. So we'll have some good information on can you, canopy can you, cover. Can you scroll down toward the Tomah Park on what you've got there? Let's see, Upper County, Rockville. It's closer. Uh, right side of the Beltway. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the, the real problem is, I don't know, let's see. 
I can't get up there to make it any bigger. Get up, go to there we go. Scroll on the side. Hmm? Scroll the bar on the right hand side to scroll. I see I don't have a bar on the right hand side. Oh. Uh, there we are. Okay. Well, okay, so let's try once more. Uh, there we are. University Park. Mm. Maplewood, okay. So this is us. In the last one, this was all brown. That's the school, Montgomery, or the elementary school field, and it was under construction during the last data session. Um, what this can do is, and they don't let you do it on this page, but each parcel is rated on the percentage of canopy, percentage of open space, and then that's all, all that data is aggregated so that you can do for the city and you can request, give me areas over 600 square feet that are suitable for planting trees, for example, and it'll pop them out. Um, so you can target your planting if you want. Um, and you can determine what areas are more forested than others. This was where you, I used this to show you the age of the houses three or four years ago. You could see where the development had occurred at different time periods. That was done with this data back and then. Just for the people who weren't here for that, just do a quick summary of that. Okay, the um, Tacoma Park was developed uh, starting in 1880s um, or thereabouts, and up until um, the Second World War, or slightly thereafter, um, houses were generally built individually. A road would be built, and the houses platted, or the lots platted out, and then a builder would come in, dig a hole, take off trees, dig a hole, put the house in, go back out the driveway, and go over and do the next. Um, after World War II, um, they started doing what is commonly referred to as overlot grading, um, where See, Cole, where Glenside, Wildwood, and actually, we're locked you, you here. You can see it on all those. Places. You can see it. The, here's the good, good examples. Mm -hmm. What they did is they came in and they built the road. They then cleared 50 foot back each side of the road and built houses, leaving the trees in the row down the back fence. These trees are all old white oaks, or most of them. The trees in the front, there aren't many, and what they are are maples or other fast-growing species. Um, let's see. You may even, I think, come on, get. See, that, that tree is only six feet in diameter, and so that's the accuracy and the detail of the data. Um, those are a couple of little trees. And then you get over here in the older section of town, and there are the big trees out arching over the street in the front yards. And that's where the houses were built individually. And in, how old is your house, Fred? 40s? Uh, 1947. Okay. Wildwood. So at that point, they were still building them one by one. And so those trees, going back to why we have them, the entire metro area was basically denuded by the time of the Civil War for firewood, construction wood, or agriculture. Tacoma Park is not equipped with soils to support agriculture in many places. Um, so they, the property was, a, property was abandoned 
And when that happened, you had regrowth, second generation of pioneer species, which by the time that development started again in the 80s was smaller trees like those there on the bridge. And there's another picture of the uh, cable car that's farther away and shows the tower and the cable car sitting on it, if you remember it, maybe over in the violet room. If you look in the back, it still has Virginia pine, which is pioneer species, and they generally only last 40 years before the oaks start coming through. And so that's in the 80s, showing that the forest started here around the time of the Civil War. Most of the big white oaks are from, and the chestnut oaks that we're losing, are from that time frame. And they've had their roots pounded on for 100 years with kids playing football or whatever in the front yards, getting your soil compacted. That's, those are the reasons that we're losing that and the drought are stressing the trees and making them susceptible. Do you want to go to some of the other items that you were? Sure. Um, you do. Can I ask you just a question sure. on this particular piece of new software? Um, how does it discriminate between the greenery of trees as, as visualized from above as opposed to the greenery just generated by shrubs and the, things the, of that the, the data was collected using infrared uh -huh. and LIDAR, which is a uh, l laser um, a la laser sonar. Mm -hmm. so they, they fly a plane at a controlled elevation, and they're sending down uh, laser and catching the rebound uh -huh. so they can tell how high the information is. When I get the information, I can come show you another thing. Uh -huh. It's actually how they now make topo maps, is they use a la later laser, and they interpolate that data and can be very accurate. <laughs> OK. I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Read they use drones. The <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, the, one of the other things I've been working on and is mentioned is um, trying to catch up with our the city's invasive control program so that I'm not such a hypocrite trying to write uh, citations to private property owners. Um, and I will be starting to be more proactive in getting people to cut the English ivy up on their trees and those kind of operations. Um, and I'm also looking into figuring out how to go back and check on how many promised replants actually got planted. Um, trying to figure out sort of a, a neutral, unbiased way of doing that um, sometime this year, coming year. Good, because that, that was my question was, do we do that? <laughs> Not very much. You know, I occasionally get complaints from people who say Joe didn't, um, but I don't want to rely on that. And what I'm thinking is I can go back, say, to 2010, pull out 50% of the permits where people promise to replant, mail out letters asking for verification, and see how it goes from there. Good. Anything else? It's open for questions. Okay. Councilmember Schultz. Um, I just really want a frank answer, and that is do you need help? to do the things that you need to do to regulate the enforcement, you know, which is, includes invasives and all the other stuff that you're responsible for? Not really for the regulation standpoint. Um, a lot of it is I'm still trying to figure out how to do it, as I've just mentioned, and, and bringing myself up. I've had, for the invasives, and, it sort of was a horrible there. I haven't been able to find a contractor that's reliable. Um, I'm pretty good with the regulatory end, with the main purpose of my job, uh -huh. and dealing with uh, managing the street trees. Um, so the outreach 
and other things, that's, that's stressful. Uh -huh. That stretches me a lot. That's a lot of work. Right. It's just that we're placing so much emphasis on sustainability in general, with a particular emphasis on things like greenhouse gases and energy savings and that sort of thing. But we would all agree that uh, preserving our tree canopy and the related stuff that we're, we want, the things we want to do is to in, encourage planting and all of that is a many faceted effort. Part of which of it is regulatory, part of which is educational, part of it is promoting and all of that. And it just seems to be a monstrously broad assignment for one person, no matter how professional that person is. Yeah, the, the, the outreach and the education is problematic. I hope to work, the Tree Commission has been doing, working on that uh -huh. and continue and we work in tandem uh, and we'll see how it goes. Okay. And I'll note that we have been joined by three members of the Tree Commission. Welcome. Plus a member of the Committee on the Environment. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Stewart. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Bolton, for the report. Um, first, I just want to uh, reiterate the point we were just making about the outreach and education. Um, I think education on not just the tree ordinance, um, but maintenance of um, trees and a healthy canopy is what I hear a lot from residents. Um, mm -hmm. They would like more information, and I'm glad to hear the Tree Commission and the Committee on the Environment are working with you and looking uh, for ways to do that. Um, the other area where I've gotten a number of questions um, over the last few months was our policy on um, solar panels and trees, and I think it would be helpful to have maybe more information on our website. Um, regarding that. Um, at the moment, there isn't information. I know you've answered questions from residents um, specifically, but, um, and I looked to my colleagues on the City Council, I think it might be helpful if we actually had something um, on the website or, or something that's clearer uh, for residents. I don't know that we really have a policy. Mm -hmm. um, we went through this a few years ago. Um, the consensus at that point was that uh, solar panels were just like any other construction. Um, and I treat um, removal requests related to construction in an avoid, minimize, mitigate process. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to put an addition on, they have to show me through design iteratives that that's the only place it can go before I you know, issue a permit. Mm -hmm. um, and I treat sort of solar panels the, other, the sort of the same way, except that I don't really consider solar panels to be a necessity, like an added bathroom because you've got two new mm -hmm. kids um, or bedroom. Um, but that is something that council could take up uh, and perhaps develop the policy. And I think there was certainly is information about, you know, how you might weigh using solar panels versus trees mm -hmm. and some of the information that we have um, from our sustainability manager also about what might be good things to consider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. when, yeah. when we were going through this last time, uh, we did go to the, uh, the, there's a bunch of tree return calculators mm -hmm. on environmental resource units uh, that, that how much a tree is worth in, uh, in resource units and might be able to somehow come up with a cost equivalency. Mm -hmm. um, but you're not only what, what you gain in electricity generation, <clears throat> and so greenhouse gas reduction, you lose in greenhouse gas absorption, mm -hmm. water quality, uh, dollar value, et cetera. So I'll look through and see what I can find mm -hmm. on that. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, sure. And then the last thing I had was um, 
a couple of months ago, um, Mr. Pasternak from Pepco was here talking to us about the tree removal. Mm -hmm. um, I know you referenced that in your report to us today. Um, the question I had is um, somebody had mentioned um, that with I think it was it's with Verizon and maybe the other utilities we have an MOU, and it, there was a question about whether or not we have an MOU with Pepco regarding no, tree the, removal. The MOU we have is with Pepco. Is with Pepco. Yeah, not with the other utilities okay. because generally they don't do the communication utilities don't do maintenance. Um, they so they don't prune trees so that we. I, we don't have a tree-related MOU with them. Okay. But we do with PEPCO. But we do with PEPCO. Okay. And I have it on the computer. Or did we get copy? it? We, we have copies. Okay. Great. It, it's a bit old. Mm -hmm. um, and part of what's happened is that the uh, Public Utilities Commission two years ago produced new standards that are mandated rather than desired. Mm -hmm. um, so far, working with PEPCO, um, with the foresters, uh, I've been able to, we have a relationship. They know Tacoma Park sensitive. They do call me before they come to work. When they're doing a planning a line, they call me, we walk the line and say yes, no, and generally um, they do what I ask them to do mm -hmm. um, and they do what they have to do. Uh, example, up on Park, up towards the other end, there's a house that had two big white oaks in the front yard and one was dying and one had a couple of hazardous branches over the wire and they wanted to take them both down. Mm -hmm. And I was able to say, they, they try and prune in four-year cycles. This time, you can take the one down that's dying, mm -hmm. and then four years later, you can get rid of the hazardous one. Um, and that's what they do. They put a note in their mm -hmm. management plans. So we, we get along. You know, we're losing, but not too badly mm -hmm. compared to other parts of the county. Terrific. Thank you. That's all I just, have. just to follow up on mm -hmm. that, it was interesting to me that when Mr. Pasternak was here, uh, he made it clear that both the city and individual property owners can just say no about removal, <laughs> and that they will note to that, and and they don't, they're not accountable if uh, that tree should cause them problems. You know, the that's they're not accountable. Um, and, but it was interesting to me that he, but, he, he would say that uh, you can, if, if they if they want to do some work, sure. you can just say no. I, you know, if it's if it's like if it's on your property or for the city in our right of way, that we can say no. We don't want you to do that. Do not do that. Yeah, um, it was it was very clear. We checked. We had him say it again. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I, you know that's I, reading the regulations as promulgated by the State Utility Commission. Right. He's saying he's willing to do something now, and he and may. We, and we have him on tape. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, he's he's not going to be free of bad publicity when that tree comes down and takes out. True. The uh, 34 kV circuit. It was interesting to me that yeah. if you really feel strongly, you can go there. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I would hope that people would use that information judiciously that, and and not just say no just because they can. Right. But that, and, it, and that it would be helpful to you in situations like you were just describing, where you could say, you know, the the, the standards are more absolute than they were. They're right. they're they're more draconian than they were. And a little balance here. Let's it's, do something. I, yeah, I mean, there's on 34 kilowatt lines, there's a 15 foot clear sky requirement, which means 15 feet either side of the wires and vertically. So you cannot have a branch over the wire. Um, and that's required in the regulations. 
but by working with the planners, we've been able to get around that in many, many cases. Um, and maybe I could just say no on everyone, <clears throat> but then I'd lose yeah. the cooperation exactly. elsewhere. Right. So I, I prefer to work with them. Uh, Council Member Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Bolton, for the report. Sure. Um, and I want to thank you for your work that uh, you did with Washington Ventus University and one of my constituents on Garland regarding the green strip. Uh, they were complaining about uh, the rain runoff, and they supposedly came to you to try to find out some type of trees that could be planted to. Okay. So good, huh? Yes. And so I appreciate it. Uh, sure. But I got a question for you regarding the bulk buy program. Can the university, the hospital, and apartment owners? Are they eligible for Absolutely. The, the university has bought 20 trees okay. in the last three years. It's been really a pleasant surprise. Okay. And the hospital, they haven't done it. Since I've been here, all they do is take down. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to see about changing that. Uh, is Should they contact you from the uh, hospital? I've, I've told, I can't remember his name, top, Bob, several times. Okay. They, they know about the bulk buy. Okay. And um, I think until they figure out what's happening on the grounds, they don't really want to invest in something that they may end up damaging. Okay. Right. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Councilmember Siemens. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you for the presentation tonight. Um, looks like great new software. <laughs> uh, anyways, I just. Um, like to make sure that the council gets a copy of the MOU with PEPCO and a um, uh, list of the mandates from the State Utility Commission. I, I can pull that re the report up. It's, hey. it's like 45 pages of legalese, but I'll, I'll find a copy and digitally maybe I can pick out the pages I, I was that pertain. Say, I, uh, and we certainly would want an electronic copy. We don't want to cut down trees to get this. Thank you. <laughs> All our papers are recycled anyway. Yeah. And I've got a question on the you, in your report. You talk about the uh, trees that were planted in the right of way uh, and, the, and the process for uh, deciding which trees go on which streets. And I know you pick a couple of streets every year. Can you just say something about? how those tr those streets get chosen? Uh, well, I, I go for economies of scale, and so I look for the lease tree streets where I can do three or four blocks in a row, because uh, if I have to send out a watering crew, right. I don't the want them watering one on Hayward, one on Hancock, one on Wildwood. So as this last year, I picked Baltimore from... Um, Tacoma down to Albany, and Albany from Baltimore up to Tacoma, and then Boyd, where we had taken a few out for the sidewalk work. And so we planted, so that's one, two, maybe 11 blocks worth of trees all together. Um, a couple of people have talked to me. I, I get suggestions, people wanting trees in front of their house. And so I then look at this or look, and look at my tree inventory and figure sort of, do they need it or do they only need one tree? And sort of figure out, I have a rolling list up on my computer of stretches that I notice as well while I'm driving around that are getting bleak. Um, Tulip was in 2013. There were, I think, maybe three trees in the right of way on Tulip from Holly all the way out to Carroll. Um, so that, that's how I choose which gets planted. Okay. Thanks. Councilmember Schultz. Sort of a, a, a process question. <clears throat> we had sidewalks, as you know, put in in 2012 uh, along Wildwood Drive. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, that following late you know, late winter, you came in and put in a lot of 
trees and you implemented the new process of sending out postcards and giving residents their choice of three right. on that particular block and and that's how trees got planted and that was fine um, but in an in example of problems come up is that uh, in the 7300 block willow trees willow oaks were planted um, they they all died because I think of the drought that particular year extraordinary that, that, that was a bad batch was like, a bad like batch. that was a bad batch like the cherry trees that died in okay. 2013 are and then those were replanted right. and all but two of those have passed in fact some of the old really? roots are starting to come up again and the little fellows are about this I'll, big. I'll come over and look again so it occurred to me and I mentioned this to uh, Miss Braithwaite that maybe we ought to try a different Type of a different tree rather than the willow oak, uh, and and then the, then it was pointed out. Well, this was the point. The postcard said they wanted this tree, right. except that a lot of those people have moved away, and so we've got a, it memorialized in the records that that it needs to be a certain species of tree. When the truth of the matter is, a lot of those people have moved away, uh, and frankly, if it came down to it, most of them would say, hey. Let's just get some trees in here that will cope maybe better with the, the soils or whatever the devil is going on there. So is, do you yeah. see a problem or am I? I, I wouldn't blame the, that it's willow oaks. Okay. They, they are one of the toughest trees around. Uh -huh. um, I'll come take a look and see if I can figure out what well, happened. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the first set was just a bad batch okay. in that yeah. They arrived at the nursery dead. That's a bad batch. <laughs> <laughs> they, they arrived. Uh -huh. It was late enough that they had turned brown, but they turned brown and they didn't even drop their leaves all winter. Right. Which means that they were dead when they arrived. Yeah, um, we have some of those on Wildwood Drive. No, I'll, I'll <laughs> go over, take a look at what's there. Um, <laughs> Ever Poplar Brown Pine is another one. Pardon? She said they're the low maintenance one, and there's on construction sites like over at the school, you get uh, pines that are planted and immediately turn brown, and you don't need to maintain them anymore. Oh, I see. Save money that way. Yeah, yeah. I suppose. Okay. All right. Well, whatever you can do, but I'm just pointing out the the side, the 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 over the, the policy question about the durability of these postcard selections right. such that at some point in, in your good judgment you might say a certain like a cherry tree just isn't isn't what we need here anymore. Right. I mean part of the reason that I, I don't think it's the that they were willow oaks is the cherry tree which is much more tender mm -hmm. on the other side of the street I think are all living. Most yeah they are. And and so that it's same climate, same soils. Mm -hmm. Same care, okay. um, and so I think it was just probably the quality of the tree. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And we have a short agenda this evening. That's it. We're adjourned. <laughs>